We are facing in our country, I think, the greatest test that we have faced, at least in my lifetime, perhaps in much more than my lifetime. We become a nation that's lost its way. And we are going to be able to find our way if we find our way back to God. Amen. That's the path the Lord wants us on. I had someone find for me two very special quotes. One by Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers. The two enemies of the people are criminals and government. So let us tie the second down the chains of the Constitution. So the second will not become the legalized version of the first. May I read that again? The two enemies of the people are criminals and government. So let us tie the second down with the chains of the Constitution so the second will not become the legalized version of the first. And then a quote by Patrick Henry. It cannot be emphasized too clearly and too often that this nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. I'd like you to take the word of God, please, and open it with me to the gospel according to Matthew, if you have your Bible open, to Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew. And we'll begin in Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. I speak on the poison of politics. We must engage with much more heart in the political system than we've ever engaged before. And I believe if we put that wholehearted effort into it, some people are surely to accuse us of leaving what God gave us to do and going after something God did not give us to do. From my earliest recollections, I remember people saying two things I don't discuss, religion and politics. You've heard that before, haven't you? Religion and politics. But we must do something to mobilize people 90 million people who claim to be a part of the evangelical Christian voting force, 90 million people, were capable of voting in the last election. 54 million of them did not vote. Imagine that. If just 10 million more of them had voted, the election would have had a different outcome. We now have a country where we're standing by, it seems, with nothing we can do while the most barbaric acts of cruelty take place all across our land. We're soon to reach the 60 million mark in aborting children, murdering the innocent, and with the blood of 60 million babies dripping from our hands. Imagine... Imagine what God must think of people, so many of whom call themselves Christians. We ought to do everything we can, not only to encourage people who are able to vote and make a difference to get out and do it, but we ought to encourage others to register to vote who are able to register and use the influence that they have in this country for the best good they possibly can. And with all the effort we're going to put forth, and we're going to put forth effort locally, statewide and nationwide, I want to make sure that our people understand that I recognize the poison of politics. I want you not just to hear what I'm saying, but I want you to be able to repeat to someone what the poison is. And so do your best to take it in, mark the passages, and become a preacher of righteousness of the gospel, avoiding the poison of politics. In the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 1, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem 
of Judea. In the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. Now the Bible says that the innocent were slaughtered at the command of this King Herod. The Lord Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and when he was born in Bethlehem, Herod was still the king. There's some discrepancy among historians about the dates. The historians have the date of Herod's death correct. Before the Common Era, 4 BCE, the dates you find in your Bible, which were added to be helpful to us, are not the inspired words of the human penman God used, the inspired writings of God. They were added much, much, much later to help people in the study of their Bibles. And I'm sure that they have provided a great deal of help for us with these suggestions about time periods. But Herod died, and another of Herod's sons came to the throne. The Bible says in verse 19 of chapter 2 in Matthew, But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now I want you to make special note of some things. We're going to talk about this in a moment with a little more detail. But the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry warned of three types of leaven. Three types of leaven. The word leaven is mentioned 17 times in the New Testament. Some people think it's something good, but we find in every time... It is not something good. It is something wicked. And I want you just to see what the Bible has to say. If you'll open your Bible to the 16th chapter of Matthew, the word of God says in verse 6 of chapter 16, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And I want you to mark Pharisees and Sadducees, if you have that marked in your Bible. The leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then if you'll turn to the Gospel according to Mark in chapter 8 and verse 15, Mark chapter 8 and verse 15, the Bible says, and he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. So we read about three types of leaven. Three types of leaven. Now, what does he mean by this? He warned us. The Lord Jesus warned us. He warned his children to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which we learn is hypocrisy. The leaven of the Sadducees, which believe in no resurrection, which is the leaven of false doctrine. And the leaven of Herod. What does that mean? What is the leaven of Herod? Now, we get the idea... We get the idea that the Christian faith is marching alongside those who have no faith. 
and alongside others who are of other faiths. And when we think we found the truth in the Bible concerning the Pharisees and Sadducees, we know that they are religious people. The Pharisees were guilty of hypocrisy. The Sadducees, as I said, guilty of false doctrine. But what about the leaven of Herod? Jesus warned against the leaven of Herod. If you look once again with me in the Gospel according to John, in the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to John, Jesus stands before Pilate and he gives this word. In verse 36 of John chapter 18, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. If I ask you this question, what would be your answer? What is the greatest possible thing we could do in this world as we serve the Lord? The greatest possible thing we could do is exactly what Jesus Christ told us to do. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's his command to us. As a matter of fact, he gives that command in a commission recorded five times, once in Matthew, once in Mark, once in Luke, once in John, and once in the book of Acts. And we know where we find those references. It takes all five of those references brought together to understand the whole of the great commission. But can you imagine Jesus Christ who came to this earth and bled and died for our sins? Think of this. Who became a man without ceasing to be God, who lived a sinless life and owed no sin debt. The Lord Jesus Christ who went to the cross and paid our debt for us. He did not die for his own guilt. He died for our guilt. The Bible says that our sins were laid on him, our iniquities on him. He bore our sin, our iniquity. He became sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. And when he died, he died for you. He paid your sin debt because a holy God, the creator God, sees us as lost, hell-deserving sinners and the debt must be paid and Christ paid that debt. Amen. He died. He died as the billows of God's wrath rolled on the Son of God as he tasted death for every man. He died for us. And on the third day, he arose from the grave alive forevermore. He spent 40 days with his disciples and ascended to heaven where he ever liveth to make intercession for us. And he said to us, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's your work. Now, I live in a world that's become the enemy of what is righteous and holy and decent. But the Lord left me in this world. He said we are in the world but not of the world. And he created institutions. He allowed them to develop. The institution of the home. The institution of government. And the institution of the church. What is his plan and purpose? In our country, in our country, we have this sacred privilege given to us by the law of the land. And thank God we are a land of laws, not personalities. And we live in a land of laws that guarantees us the certain pursuits of these, these innate things, these unalienable rights God has given us, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our founding fathers who believed in liberty and came to found this country on that principle, the liberty God's given us and we answer to God for that liberty and to that God we answer for the liberty he's given to us and not to the government because the government didn't give it to us. So as we answer to that liberty, we're to exercise it. If we do not speak up, we will lose at some point in time our ability and right to speak up. So in a, in a government, Politics are practiced. Most often it appears that someone who has some ambition organizes things to help them become a force to be reckoned with and to govern. 
and we want everything to be done so well like we want it done, we engage in it to get the right people elected, the wrong people out of office, and we listen for decency and humility so that we can be wholeheartedly behind the people who want to serve. And I say serve as our elected officials. They have power also to appoint many powerful people who appoint others to commissions and committees that wield lots of power and authority in our lives. So why engage? Why do we get involved? And I want to remind you of something. But before I do, let me tell you just a little story. Rome ruled the world and they recognized that there was a geopolitical purpose and special place for the land of Palestine, or as we call it today, Israel. Rome surrounded the Mediterranean Sea. They wanted to place a ruler in that particular area of Palestine who could be used by Rome to the greatest benefit. In 44 BCE, before Common Era, or BC, they appointed, the Roman Senate appointed Herod. We know him later as Herod the Great because of what he built. They appointed him to be the king. They, they called him the king of the Jews. He ruled in a troubled land. He started or continued a dynasty. He took the place of his father, ruling there. He didn't really begin to rule as king until 37 BCE, and he died in 4 BCE. When he died, three of his sons had the kingdom that he ruled over divided among them. Antipas, Archelaus, and Philip. We read a moment ago that Archelaus could not keep his position long. He was recalled because of his cruelty. His father had been a madman and killed his own family, children and wives. And he ruled with force. He exercised such force, it became so great that people wanted to be on his side and wanted him to be in power and be connected with him. The Herodian dynasty continued for a century. It finally, it finally ended with Agrippa II near the end of the first century. And Jesus Christ lived in that time on earth when he came to become a man without ceasing to be God. And he warned his followers, beware of the Pharisees and the leaven, what they want to add, the hypocrisy that they add to faith and religion. Beware of the Sadducees. May I say, what they give is poison, the false doctrine they promote with the religious prestige that they have, the false doctrine they promote is poison. And then he said, beware of the leaven of Herod. What do you mean by it? There were people, political people, religious people, who wanted in with the worldliness of the Herodian dynasty. They had the feeling if we can just have the power the rulers have, if we can exercise the authority that the rulers exercise, if we can just stay near the people in power and try to ensure the people in power are for us, that's what we need. And Jesus said, beware of that leaven. It's poison. It will corrupt everything else. In other words, Pharisees, hypocrisy, Sadducees, false doctrine, the Herodians, worldliness, and the world's wisdom and the world's power. And so Jesus Christ and his followers spent much time talking about where the real power lies and what our real work is. It was not ensuring that you keep the Herodian dynasty alive. It was not trying to ride our religious things on the coattails of the Herodian dynasty. 
It was not trying to make sure if they're in office, we're protected. Because once we succumb to that, once we substitute anything instead of or in front of what God's given us to do, that thing we substitute for our mission becomes poison. Poison. The poison of politics is to think politics is the answer. The poison of politics is to think the greatest power lies with those who rule or who are elected and hold the highest office in the land. The poison of politics is to spend our energy in the political system to the neglect of getting the gospel to the lost and dying of the world. That's the poison of it. All of us are going to give our lives to something or someone. All of us. All of us. And we're going to see people in communities, in public gatherings, promoting everything they can possibly promote to get someone elected. And by the way, I'm going to work hard to get someone elected. And I hope you'll work hard to get the right people elected. But I want to ask God in heaven to help me to be so discerning that I never substitute that for getting the gospel and obedience to Christ to tell people what the Lord can do for them. If I do, if I become enamored with some position, or if I become enamored with some recognition by some political personality, or if I become enamored with the power that we get by being in favor with people who are in office, if that takes my love, if it takes my energy, it takes my motivation, away from Christ and the greatest work of preaching and teaching people about the Lord Jesus, then no matter how great it appears, it's poison. It'll be poison to the individual. It'll be poison to our families. It'll be poison to our churches. So Jesus said, let me be warning you, beware of this creeping into your lives. My kingdom is not this world. Beware, beware that you keep your eyes upon the Lord. You know to beware of the Pharisees. You know to beware of the Sadducees. But Jesus said, I want you to also beware of the Herodians. Are there fine men and women, decent men and women in political office or running for political office? I certainly hope there are. I'm not, a, I'm not voting on to be the pastor of a church. And I want to find as much decency as possible and so do you. I'm not asking them to be a Sunday school teacher. I'm asking them to do the best job they can to serve and follow the Constitution of the United States of America. But I don't want that to ever get my all to the neglect of giving Christ my all and the gospel my all. So what is the poison of politics? It's not engaging in government to try to see the right people elected. It's letting that take our lives to live someday to regret what we could have done if we had given it to the Lord. A very famous man in a generation ago, if you'd like to know his name, I'll tell you privately, but I haven't asked him if I could give his name, so I'm not going to. Said if we had spent as much time trying to win souls and trying to start churches and strengthen the churches that exist as we did trying to get people elected, we'd have the different America, the better America that we wanted in the first place. So he has my heart. He should have your heart. Anything that takes our heart from him is poison. And let's keep that in mind while we're working hard, as hard as we can work to put the right people in office who will stop some of this godless behavior that's going on across our land 
and people ignoring it. The leaven of Herod. Let's pray, maybe. Before we can really do all we ought to do for any political endeavor, there ought to be a new commission in our hearts to God's commission for us. A renewed energy given to do the Lord's work the Lord's way. How many of you get the point? Would you raise your hand? You get the point. Well, then you keep people from complaining if they think we're too political because we're going to ask God to help us do all we can politically and at the same time avoid the poison of politics.